was working, now it's working, okay. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and begin. Om Asato Ma Sadgamaya Tamaso Ma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityor Ma Mritam Gamaya Aviravir Maedhi Rudrayate Dakshinam Mukham Tenamam Pahinityam Lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from darkness unto light. Lead us from death to immortality. Reach us through and through ourself, O Lord, and protect us evermore from ignorance by thy sweet, compassionate face. Om Vishnu Arva Tripuranta Ko Bhavatu Va Brahma Surindro Tava Bhanur Va Shashalakshanot Bhagavan Buddha Tasiddha Tava Ragadvesha Visharati Moharahita Satvanu Kampodhyato Yasarvai sahasamskrito bunaganais tasmai namasarvadam. The supreme reality and its messengers are known by various names in various traditions. But as for me, I offer my worship always to the one going by any name and belonging to any tradition who is free from attachment and hatred free from worldliness and delusion, who is filled with compassion towards all living beings, and who is possessed of all noble virtues. Om Shanti 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 Harihi Om Tat Sat Om Peace, Peace, Peace be unto us all. So my welcome, or I shouldn't say my welcome, it's not personal, welcome, the Vedanta Society of Greater Houston welcomes all of you to a very special program. We're very happy to have Swami Sarva Priyanandaji here with us to speak on self-realization. Uh, he doesn't need much introduction because uh, wherever he goes, many people come because he's already well known. <laughs> so let me just say by way of to, to fulfill formalities. Uh, he joined the Ramakrishna Mission in 1994. Uh, he had his sannyasa in 2004 from uh, Swami Ranganathan. And you're a disciple of Swami Ranganathan. Uh, disciple of Swami Bhuteshananji. Oh, Bhuteshananji. Disciple of the great Swami Bhuteshananji and a sannyas disciple of Swami, the great Swami Ranganathanandaji Maharaj. Both of them very great uh, uh, and renowned uh, monks of the order, very holy and highly respected monks of the order. Uh, he's held various uh, important positions in the order since his joining, all in the field of education. Uh, though his uh, uh, educational training was not in education, it's appropriate that he's been an educator since joining because he's a natural teacher. Uh, and that's why he's so popular on YouTube because he has the uh, unusual ability to make complex ideas of the Vedanta uh, easy to comprehend and accessible to people. And so we're very happy to have him here. I, well, let me just say a little bit more that he was uh, uh, the first registrar of Vivekananda University, uh, which is just outside of Belar Mutt. And uh, then he was an Acharya at the training center in Belar Mutt, the seminary for the novices of the order. Uh, and then in 2015, he came to Southern California, to Hollywood, as assistant to Swami Sarvadevanandaji. But the authorities at Belar Mutt wanted to give him a, uh, uh, a uh, new field and sent him to the Vedanta Society of New York in 2000, January 2017. And their idea, because I was in Bellarmat at the time when it was being discussed, was that was the anniversary year of Swami, or recently had been the anniversary year of Swami Abhidamandaji's birth. 
and he had been the head of the Vedanta Society of New York for many years. So they wanted to uh, send someone who uh, would represent the order uh, uh, in a wonderful uh, way. So they chose him as the best person to be head of the Vedanta Society of New York. And so he, that is where he resides now. So again, we're very happy to have him here. He's a personal friend, someone that I'm very fond of. We used to have coffee together in the mornings at Bellar Mutt and uh, enjoy our discussions over coffee. And so I'm always happy to be with him again. And so it's a delight for me. And I know it's a delight, delight for you. And that's why so many of you have come. And we also have a live stream audience as well with many more people who can see. So with that, I'll ask the Swami to address you on his chosen topic of self-realization. Om Asatoma Sagamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityurma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Good morning and Namaste everybody. Revered Swami Atmarupanandaji, <laughs> um, respected Shweta Chaitanyaji, and dear friends, it's wonderful to be back here in Houston and to see so many familiar faces and so many new faces too. So the subject I have chosen is I would like to speak about self-inquiry today. And uh, when I, it's my favorite subject. So everybody knows that you, <laughs> one Swami told me that you have only one subject and that is you are Brahman and that's it. <laughs> When I looked up, I, I always get confused in the English spelling of the en word inquiry, you know, the E-N and the I-N. So when I looked up the dictionary and it said in uh, British English, when you use E-N and you start with E, it is a question about information. So what's for lunch and uh, what's the time and so on. And when you start with I, it's an in uh, investigation, inquiry investigation. Here in the United States, of course, we use EN for everything. Uh, but today, the sense in which I'm going to talk about self-inquiry is in the second sense, in the IN sense, an investigation into who we are, what we are. Immediately, the question would arise, of course, what's the point? I know who I am. I mean, that's the first thing I know. I can tell you a lot about myself my bio data, which I submit for my, my job resume and you know what I had to say for the immigration, that tells you who I am. So I know who I am. And in any case, what's the good of knowing who I am? I have always known this and I'm still the miserable creature that I am, suffering in samsara. What good does it do? And Vedanta, we know it says that we actually truly do not know who or what we are. Swami Vivekananda, when he would talk to uh, people in this country, would sometimes say with a degree of pathos that if only you knew yourself as you really are. That's the inquiry into what Vedanta promises that to find out what we truly are. And the result, you say, what's the point of this exercise? The result, the promise is tremendous. Atyantika dukkha nivritti paramananda praptishya, overcoming suffering transcending suffering and attainment of fulfillment. Who does not want that? So an inquiry into oneself, Atma Vichara, with the result of attainment of lasting fulfillment, deep and lasting fulfillment, uh, transcending suffering. So that's what we're going to talk about all in one hour, I think. Um, Atma Vichara, self-inquiry. Last year, we were at, at Harvard. One of the courses that I took was in the philosophy department, Emerson. By the way, there's an interesting history about the Emerson buildings, named after, of course, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was associated with Harvard for a long time until he gave a talk which was very Vedantic. If you read that talk, what he said was very Vedant Vedantic. And he was promptly banned from Harvard in those days. People were not so... Uh, open and accepting. 
So, and ultimately when he became the, maybe the leading thinker, intellectual, certainly the philosopher of, of the uh, United States, finally Harvard had to accept him back. And so they named the philosophy department after him. So there I took this course last year in the philosophy of mind. I thought it would be a good introduction to all the current literature in mind and consciousness studies. And they always start uh, any good philosophy of mind course, in the Western world at least, uh, they will start with Descartes. And Descartes' project of trying to find a sure ground for knowledge. With that, uh, what is it that one can be certain of? What is it that cannot be doubted? And we know Descartes, who's known as a great mathematician. We all studied the Cartesian plane in, in uh, school, but also a scientist and a philosopher. We know he found the famous cogito ergo sum that uh, I think, there, therefore, I exist. Uh, he found that he could doubt everything. In the whole world, you could doubt. And especially in today's world of matrix and uh, the artificial reality and all, you can see how something could be projected. It looks real, but it isn't real. So he said, it, everything that we know can be doubted. I could be dreaming. Or as he put it, it could be the projection of an evil demon. And the only one thing that I cannot doubt is that I am doubting. That there is somebody who's thinking these thoughts. I am thinking. That I cannot doubt. If I doubt that, that's also a thought. I am still thinking. So the doubter cannot be doubted. I mean, such an echo of Adi Shankaracharya writing 1,200 years ago. Whoever doubts the existence of the Atman, it's the Atman of that very person. So even in doubting, I, I, in doubting my own existence, I prove my own existence. And therefore, I exist because I am thinking. And I can't resist that old hackneyed joke about this. You know, Descartes is sitting in a Parisian cafe. Just imagine that. And he's having a cup of coffee. And a waiter comes up, a waitress comes up and says, Monsieur Descartes, would you like another cup of coffee? And he says, I think not. And he promptly disappeared. I think not. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I had to say that. But then, after that, what he does, if you read the meditations, we read the English translations of the meditations in that course, he promptly moves ahead with his um, project. I exist. Now, next step, how do I prove the existence of God and through the existence of God, back to the existence of the universe? So he's back into the world and God again. And those are not very convincing. There's a reason why his cogito ergo is, um, uh, is popular. You know, people have heard about it. We have heard about it. And his later, the things he said later are not particularly well known outside philosophical circles. The reason is those arguments don't carry much weight. I remember Professor Cheryl Chen there in the class. She said, notice how the bar is dropping very fast for good argumentation, the standards have been quickly reduced to, <laughs> uh, to prove the existence of God, prove the existence of the world. What Vedanta would say there is, not so fast, not so fast, Monsieur Descartes. You have moved fast from the existence of the self to other things quickly, back into the world. Stay with what you have found. Instead of moving out in that direction, move back and investigate what you have found. And maybe your project of establishing the world and God on found, uh, firm foundations will be more successful. What can Descartes find? What can we find if you stay with I, with the self? In the most radical text of non-dualism, Ashtavakra Gita, the sage Ashtavakra sings, about what can you find if you stay with the self? Atma sakshi vibhu purna eko mukta shchidakriya asango nispriha shanto brahmat samsara vaniva You, the self, you are the witness consciousness, you are you appear as this entire universe. 
You are complete in yourself, infinite, complete in yourself. You are one reality. You are free. You are beyond change and action. You are completely unattached. You are beyond desire, beyond thirst for things, Miss Priya. And peace itself, Shanta. Only by illusion, only by error, only by a mistake, only by not seeing, only by not inquiring, I am inquiring. Brahmat, an error arises by which we think of ourselves as samsari, as, in, in, as involved and trapped in this world as this little person struggling in this world. This is what we're going to talk about in the next 45 minutes or so. What we can find if we just stay with ourselves. Our favorite subject, I, me, myself. Stay with it. If you love yourself so much, stay with yourself and see what treasures can, will be revealed to us. Everything in this universe will be revealed to us. We will understand what this world is, we will understand what God is, and most of all, we will understand something stunning about who or what we are, Atma, the self. So it starts with an inquiry into oneself. See, yesterday I was at a, uh, uh, at a ceremony in a temple just outside Houston where Lord Jagannath, Subhadra, uh, Balaram, they are being the Prana Pratishta, the uh, established, the, the deities were established in the temple. And somebody was asking the question after a discussion that um, suppose somebody doubts all of this. You know, it could be a matter of faith. You're believing in God and believing in God in this form and all these rituals and mythologies. And is there any way to spirituality? Suppose you start with doubt. Is there any way to spirituality? There is. This is the way. Why is this the way? Because there is something that you cannot doubt. Forget God and rituals and mythology and um, faith. Come to something that you cannot doubt, your own very existence. What do we find? So what's the first thing that we find, Ashtavakra tells us? Atma Sakshi. The first thing is, is a bombshell. That what exactly are we? By inquiry, we find that we are not at all what we thought we, are, we were. That this individual being of flesh and blood, thoughts and feelings and emotions, a person encased in a cage of flesh and blood. We take it for granted that I am this thing. And Vedanta hammers at that. The first step in Vedanta is like a, like an, like a nuclear bomb which blasts all our preconceptions about what or who we are. And Vedanta gives us methods, a method of inquiry, a method of looking into ourselves. If you follow that, uh, it's, it's not very difficult. I mean, you may say that I'm still not enlightened after all of this, but it's difficult if you, if you listen carefully and if you try to follow what is being said, it will be difficult to deny that there is something to it. Something, there are depths to oneself that we never thought about earlier. How do you proceed? Multiple approaches are given in Vedanta. One of my favorite is the Drik Drishya Viveka, the way of uh, inquiring into the seer and the seen. There's nothing esoteric about this, nothing really extraordinary about this. It's the ordinariness of it which is uh, amazing. All our experience, including the experience we are having right now, all our experience has this structure, subject and object, seer and seen. Right now, you are looking and you're seeing, you are the seer and here is what you are seeing. Not only are you seeing, uh, we are hearing and smelling and tasting and touching. So we are the seer. We always think of ourselves as the subject, as the knower, as the seer. And all of this is the object. Things in the world, even people, um, whatever we come across, ideas, all of these are objects. And Vedanta says, notice, the subject and the object are different. They're different entities. So you are there, you are the subject, and whatever else you see, those objects, they are quite obviously different from you. Different from you means they're separate entities. They are not, you don't say, 
I am this table. I don't say that. I know this table. I see this table. Therefore, it's an object. I am the subject. You say, yeah, I, that's pretty simple. Move on. But there's a very simple fact. The moment we apply it to ourselves, then it becomes very interesting. Everything is an object. Fine. It's different from me. Fine. The body? The body. Is it an object? Yes. Of course it's an object. What's the definition of an object? It must be in the category of the known. It must be in the category of the seen. I can see the body. I can touch the body. And if it's very hot and humid, I can even smell the body. <laughs> and uh, if uh, hungry and your tummy is rumbling, you can hear the body. Every sense organ objectifies the body. Vividly, directly, intimately. It's an object. It's an object to all of our senses. And therefore, by our rule, the subject and the object, the seer and the seen, the drashta and drishya must be different. The drashta is different from the drishya. I, the knower, am different from this thing called the body. And here is the first big step. Where do I stand? Before inquiry, I am inquiry. Before that, I stood in the body in the sense that I am this thing. What are you? Here, point to yourself here. What is this? It's me, it's I. I am the body and the body is I. That's what I thought before inquiry. Upon inquiry, it arises that the body is an object. I must, even if I don't feel that way, I must admit the body is as much of an object as this thing. This, this inert thing out there, it's an object. This is also out there. I am somewhere in there, but this is an object. Immediately one might protest. Yeah, that's right, but if you knock this thing, nothing happens to me. But if you hit me, it hurts. If you pinch me, it hurts. If you burn me, it burns, it's scalding. In fact, in the Upadesha Sahasri, one of uh, Shankaracharya's disciples, there's a question answer format, and the disciple says, wait a minute, the body is an object, yes, but it gets burnt, it hurts. How can I say it's an object? And the answer is, slow, take it carefully here. That hurt, that sharp, burning, stinging sensation, are you aware of it? Of course. When it happens, I'm aware of that pain. Nothing else I'm aware of. I'm aware of the pain. If I'm aware of it, I am the subject and the pain is an object. I am the drashta. This is a drishya. It's a subtle object. It's very intimate. It's directly revealed to me. It's overpowering. Nevertheless, an object. I was there before it. I am there uh, experiencing it. And it will disappear again. I'll still be there. I and the pain are not one entity. The pain is something that appears in the horizon of my awareness, shines there. The shining is not a word you'd normally <laughs> associate with pain. It shines, and then it diminishes and disappears and replaced by something else. It's an object as much as the body, as much as this. Thoughts, even these Vedantic thoughts which we are having, it's an object. I'm aware of it. I'm aware of thinking about Vedanta. It's an object. I am not the thought. I am that which is aware of the thought. I am that in which the thought appears is illumined, and, into, and in, in whose light the thought disappears again. I am the drashta, the thought is a drishya, and drashta must be different from the drishya. Why? By our uh, principle, which, which, which we started, the obvious idea that subject and object must be two different things. It's as simple as the, I like this example of the eyes. You see, the eyes see everything, but they're different from uh, everything. It's only because the things are different from the eyes, at a distance from the eyes, that you're able to see them. In fact, the only thing that the eyes cannot see are the eyes themselves. You cannot directly see them. But everything is revealed to the eyes. In the same way, you, the drashta, the seer, the experiencer, you are different from everything that you experience. Not only the things of the world which we admit, but of the body, of the breath, of the thoughts, of the intellect, the understanding, the faculty of understanding which we are employing right now, and try to go beyond that in deep meditation or in deep sleep. The blankness, that too is an object. 
we I can see slightly puzzled looks at this point. Think about it, it's a subtle point, but it's true. Even deep sleep, the experience, it's an experience. I, I always say that it's not the absence of experience, it's an experience of absence, deep sleep. There is still experience, but if we can understand how deep sleep is an experience, we will understand what the sakshi, what the drashta truly is. So normally, we mix up the drashta with the mind. But the drashta, the seer, the sakshi, the witness, witness consciousness is not the mind. The mind too is an object to this witness consciousness. Therefore, Ashtavakra sings, what is this sakshi? What is it made of? He says, chit. Atma Sakshi Vibhu Purna Eka Mukta Chid Akriya Chit Consciousness. If I say I'm the body, I know what this body is made of. It's made of flesh and blood and bone and organs and cells. If I say I'm the mind, I know what the mind is made of. Sort, sort of I know. I mean, it's made of thoughts and feelings and ideas and memories, desires. That's what the mind is made of. But if I say I'm the witness, what is that witness made of? What is the material? What exactly are you telling me? What kind of thing am I? I'm not a thing, but what, what is it exactly? It is consciousness. Chit. Ashtavakra says, you are chit, pure consciousness. This is not an idea which is understood in modern thought, either philosophy or in science, even in neuroscience. Now, there's a lot of interest in consciousness studies. And one area I have found all the time which is really messing up the field, is the inability to distinguish between consciousness and mind. It's natural, understandable. The, more, the way we use the word consciousness or awareness in day-to-day -day parlance in our conversation. Give me some examples of, if I say give me some examples of objects, uh, table and chair and shirt and fan, give me some example of consciousness. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas, memories, Desires. This is what we think about as consciousness, experiences, basically. Conscious experiences. But Vedanta says consciousness and what it experiences are two different things. What it experiences continuously changes. It appears to you, the consciousness, and it disappears. Whatever you know is an object. That which knows is consciousness. Whatever you are aware of is an object. You I mean, there's no word for it. Uh, maybe you can say, you, the awareness, you are not an object. This non-objective awareness, this non-objective consciousness is what is called chit in Vedanta. Uh, it's a very elegant definition. In fact, in modern consciousness studies, you'll find that they find it very difficult to define consciousness. Uh, there are so many definitions, none of them very satisfactory. One scientist, a mathematician, Mohan Maharaj, he once said that your consciousness studies is uh, not a mature subject. I said, why? Because until you're able to define your field of study, how can it be a science? And you are unable to define consciousness, and he's right. Vedanta has a very elegant, practical, direct definition of consciousness. Shankaracharya's disciple, Padmapada Acharya, he says, Anidam Chaitanyam, not this consciousness. Consciousness is that's not this awareness. What does this mean? Very simple and very direct. We can all experience it right now. Whatever you can say, this, it's not consciousness. This table, not consciousness. The one which knows this table is consciousness. This body, not consciousness. The one which is experiencing this body is consciousness. This breath, these thoughts. See, how what an elegant way of distinguishing between mind and consciousness. Can you say these thoughts, these thoughts are troubling me. These are positive thoughts. These are wonderful thoughts. These are inspiring Vedantic thoughts. These object. Therefore, they cannot be consciousness. They are objects to consciousness just as this is a, this is a gross, that means a physical object and the thoughts in the mind are subtle objects, but they are objects to consciousness. And consciousness is not this. In fact, if one can 
sort of get a feel for this definition, it will take you to the doorstep of enlightenment. Just a feel for the definition, not this. And if you consistently apply it, sit quietly and apply it, whatever comes to mind, look at, look at the phrase, comes to mind, object, not this, but that which is aware of this, is chit, is consciousness. This distinction between mind and consciousness. The mind changes. But world changes, body changes, mind changes. Consciousness is that which does not change. So are you stipulating that consciousness does not change? Are we supposed to take it on authority that consciousness does not change? No, on reason. Imagine, if consciousness changes, suppose, you say, why, not, why can't consciousness change? If consciousness changes, then what would experience that change? So you are aware, I'm aware of the change in consciousness. If I'm aware of a change in consciousness, then that change in consciousness, that consciousness with change is an object. It's not consciousness. It becomes this. One might say, suppose there's a change in consciousness and we don't know about it. Unknown change in consciousness, meaningless talk. If something cannot be known, in principle it cannot be known, why talk about it? Even science will not accept such a thing. It should be knowable in principle. The moment it is knowable, even in principle, it becomes an object. Change. If you're going to talk about change in consciousness, if it is knowable, it's an object. Consciousness is beyond change. The unchanging consciousness. Chid Akriya. Look at Ashtavakra. Chid Akriya. The unchanging, actionless awareness. What is that? Sakshi. You say, good for Sakshi. What about me? Atma. It's you. You are that Sakshi, the Drashta, the witness consciousness, the pure consciousness, which is beyond change. Still, a long way to go. Consciousness, all right. But you know, we have got with such body identification, we immediately feel, okay, here is a consciousness which is beyond change. The seer, the Sakshi, witness. And here are so many people. One consciousness, two consciousnesses, three, four, five, six, seventy, eighty, seven billion consciousnesses around the world, and all billions of animals and plants and whatnot, all consciousnesses, billions and billions of consciousnesses. Ashtavakra says, Ekaha, one consciousness. That sounds kind, kind of counterintuitive. Why should I accept that is one consciousness? You can see how much is packed into one verse. <laughs> That's Ashtavakra for you. Just about every verse packs the entirety of Advaita Vedanta for you. In very simple language. One uh, uh, author, a translator of Ashtavakra, in his beautiful introduction, he says, after all the philosophers and poets and uh, scriptures and prophets and have, they have all sages have fallen silent, Ashtavakra begins. The words, he says, the words are so luminous, they seem to appear on the paper and disappear into, into awareness afterwards. So he says, Akriyaha, act changeless, Ekaha, one consciousness, in all beings, not separate consciousnesses. So here is the huge difference between Advaita Vedanta and Sankhya. Ancient difference. The Sankhya philosophy, the first philosophers of the world, Swami Vivekananda says, Kapila is the first philosopher of the, of the human race. He said, many consciousnesses, Bahupurusha. Why not? There are so many beings, each of us is a separate consciousness. Why? Why do you say there are different consciousnesses? How else, the Sankhyan says, how else would you explain? The birth of one is not the birth of everybody. When one person dies, thankfully everybody does not die. But we immediately will reply, but that's the birth of the body. That's the death of the body. It's not even the birth of the mind or the death of the mind. The subtle body continues from lifetime to lifetime, let alone consciousness. Well, the Sankhyan will say, you're right, but what about you know, something conscious like waking and sleeping? When one person is awake, everybody should be awake. If one person falls asleep, everybody should fall, fall asleep if we are all one consciousness. Thank God that's not the case. Otherwise, it would be a disaster in Vedanta classes. Because inevitably, somebody was sleeping. And if everybody falls asleep, <laughs> it would be a disaster. 
But again, the answer from the Vedantic perspective is uh, simple. Waking, dreaming, deep sleep. These, these, we may use the term conscious, unconscious. But basically these are states of the mind, not of consciousness. It's the mind which wakes up. It's the mind which becomes restless, the mind which becomes tired, the mind which goes to sleep, the mind which dreams. And all of this is revealed by consciousness. Why are you saying consciousness wakes up, consciousness dreams, or consciousness um, uh, sleeps? No. So the sleeping of one is not the sleeping of all. Well, the Sankhyan would say, well, what about enlightenment? You become, you realize, you know, in Vedanta or in Sankhya, you realize I'm pure consciousness. If one consciousness realized that, all would realize if we're all one. Unfortunately, that does not happen. If my guru realizes, becomes enlightened, does not mean that I become enlightened. So we must be separate consciousnesses. It seems to be a clincher. No, not even that. Vedanta says your ignorance and enlightenment, seeing and not seeing, getting it and not getting, waking up and in terms of enlightenment, waking up is in the mind again. Consciousness is never in ignorance. Consciousness is never enlightened. Consciousness is beyond both ignorance and enlightenment. Enlightenment and ignorance are in the realm of Maya. Why are we attributing it to consciousness? So, how will you distinguish one consciousness from another? See, it's uh, not all that difficult. You can distinguish bodies. You can count. Right here you can count how many bodies there are. 70, 75, 80 people. You can even distinguish minds. You talk to people, you will get different uh, responses, different views. Um, you know, an opinion poll will give different opinions, showing that we have different minds. You can't physically count the minds, but by a survey, you can easily see minds in the bodies are working differently. But apart from the body and the mind, if you think of consciousness in itself, you see it's a homogeneous reality. Where will you partition consciousness? On what basis will you? It feels like we are different consciousnesses because we have a strong body rooting. We are so, we are standing in the body. That's why it feels separate. Stand in consciousness. One step, stand in the mind, you will find that all bodies are in the mind. In your thoughts only, in your thinking, you have your own body and other people also. Go one step back into consciousness itself. You will find all bodies and minds are appearances in consciousness. How will you distinguish one consciousness from another consciousness? In the 13th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna says to Arjuna, Kshetragyam chapimam vidhi sarva kshetreshu bharata. O oh, Arjuna, know me alone to be the one consciousness in all the fields. He calls all these bodies fields. And the one who knows the field in that body, you know the, your own, own body and through that external world, you are the knower of the field, Kshetragya. And immediately we feel, oh, so many fields, so many bodies, so, so many knowers of the body. Immediately Krishna says, no. Ultimately, if you investigate, there is only one knower of the body. And I, Krishna, am the knower of the body. Here is the Vedantic idea of God. The Vedantic idea of God is that one consciousness in all bodies and minds, the one consciousness associated with the entire cosmic mind, the entire cosmic body, the Virat and the Hiranyagarbha, the one consciousness behind that is Ishwar, God. All of this packed into one little word by Ashtavakra, Ekaha, one. There is, a, you know, in, in Banaras, if you go to Trailanga Swami's the little uh, place where, so there's a picture of Sri Ramakrishna meeting Trailanga Swami. Uh, it's a, I think it must be a painting, obviously. There's no photograph there. And Trailanga Swami was Maun at that time. You know, he lived for more than 200 years, uh, nearly 300 years, actually. And Sri Ramakrishna met him. So Sri Ramakrishna in the picture is shown as asking him, is it two or is it one? He's also using sign language. And Trilanga Swami is showing, showing it's one. I remember once I was a novice, a brahmachari in our ashram in Deoghar. We're sitting down for dinner with the monks and the students. And there, there would be a trolley with a big cauldron and uh, the cook who would be distributing chapatis. And I was talking to the, a friend of mine, another novice, telling him this story. Sri Ramakrishna is asking two or one. And Trilanga Swami says one. And this person was passing by him. He gave me one chapati and went. <laughs> 
I wanted to. <laughs> but it's too late because he's, he's moving very fast. The philosopher Arindam Chakravarti told me that many, many uh, decades ago, he met uh, Ananda Mahima. Ananda Mahima, who is a very well-known mystic in north of India in those days. But the thing you would know about her is, if you, the impression one gets is she's a pure devotee of Krishna. And the professor told me, if you talk to her, she was true and true a non-dualist, Advaita. In, in her very devotional, simple language, she said to them, to this uh, young man and others who had come, in Bengali, Do niye to dunya baba. Dunya, the word which is used for the word samsara in Bengali, Hindi, and some other languages also, dunya. She made a play on that. It's taking do means two. The moment you have two, you have samsara, you have the world. Without the two, there's only God. Ekaha. What about this world? We have one consciousness. Fine, if we, even if we accept that. But that one consciousness is aware of a world. Did you not distinguish between um, consciousness and its objects? So I am consciousness, fine. But what about this world? Where did all of this come from? Cars and buildings and people and animals and stars and quasars and quarks and protons. Where did all of this come from? Ashtavakra says, Vibhuhu. Vibhu, normally the word Vibhu means all-pervading. That's how it's translated. In this case, Vivattam Bhavati Vibhuhu. I'll move a little fast here. Um, the two ways of interpreting it. Vividham Bhavati Vibhuhu. That one reality has become many. But how does consciousness become many? The only way consciousness, that one consciousness can be many, is as appear as many to itself. Yesterday I saw a wonderful ritual. We had a six hour puja yesterday for the establishment of the Jagannath uh, deities. A six hour puja in the Houston heat outside. Not in the, in the air conditioning, in the Houston heat outside. Six hour puja. But I saw many subtle aspects of the puja. So when the deities are finally consecrated, and um, the first thing, so there's a cloth which finally binds the uh, eyes of the deity, and after certain rituals, the cloth is removed. The first thing that the deity sees, a mirror is brought before the deity. The deity sees it. God sees God. Such a beautiful and uh, Advaitic uh, uh, insight in there. Vibhuhu, I alone appear as the many. I, not Sarva Priyananda, not this fellow in the body-mind. I, that one consciousness, Sakshi, Ekaha, one in all beings. I alone appear as many, and I'm seeing myself. You know, this, this is the universe, is the mirror in which God is seeing God. Vivu, vivattam bhavati. What is the technical meaning of this vivattam bhavati? Just a slight uh, technical note here. The word vivatta is uh, very interesting. This is what distinguishes. At this point, Advaita Vedanta is disting distinguished from all the other schools. Vivatta means appearance without changing. So milk, for example, changes into yogurt and ice cream and all the other milk products. It really changes. Something's going on there. It changes. But, um, for example, the movie screen doesn't change into the movie characters and the you know, cars and a villain and the hero and the car chase. None of that. The movie screen has not changed into those things. It appears without changing. The classic example of a rope appearing is a snake. Somebody saw a snake. Somebody saw a discarded garland. Somebody saw a crack in the ground. It was a rope all along. The rope did not become a snake or a garland or a crack in the ground. It appeared by error, by mistake. But whatever reason, without changing, if something appears as something else, that is called vivartha. And Advaita Vedanta holds that this one consciousness is appearing to itself as the universe. All of this is nothing other than you. You are looking at yourself. You are the deity looking at yourself in the mirror. And what do you see? The universe, and people, and a body, and a mind, 
And without knowing, and without not seeing, without inquiry, what do you become? I am this body and mind interacting with this world. I become small. One of our great swamis in the past, Swami Virajanandaji, in one place he says, this entire universe, this world is presented to me at once, including this body and mind. Either all of it I am or none of it I am. Either I am this mind, this body, like every one of us we feel that, but also every body and mind in the universe. Or none of it, I am just the pure consciousness. Our mistake is we flow into this body and mind and we think about it this much I am up to the limit of the skin and outside the skin, other. Do, dunya. Vivattam bhavati. I'll move even faster. I want to share something with you which I really liked. I heard this from the current Shankaracharya of Puri. So he, there he, he says in just one sentence, he says, and this has to be unpacked. I would say that it's, it requires a series of lectures to unpack. In one sentence, he says, this entire universe is nothing other than you, the pure consciousness. How? In seven steps. Very quickly. What are the seven steps? You see, logically, in front of your eyes, he's dissolved the universe back into consciousness. He says, the seven steps, first of all, take the world as it is, jagat, world, exactly as you know it. And then just think about it, inquiry. It is the play of matter, energy, time, and space. And no scientist will ever disagree with this. In classical uh, Indian philosophical terms, pancha bhuta vilasa. It is the expansion, the extension of the five elements. The sky and fire, um, air and fire and water and earth. This is an ancient cosmology. It is basically matter and energy, time and space. This is this universe. Fine so far. Pancha Bhuta Vilasa. But what is Pancha Bhuta Vilasa? The next step is crucial. Step three. Maya Vilasa. All of it is resolved back into Maya. Now at this point, the Venerable Shankaracharya will immediately fall back, up, back upon Shruti Pramana. When the Upanishad says that the five Bhutas have emerged from that Brahman through the agent, agency of Maya, which is added by Advaita Vedanta. So everything is dissolved back into Maya, this paradoxical neither is nor is not. At this point, somebody might say, hey, wait a minute. I don't mean to rain on your parade, but you're moving too fast here. Why should I believe that all matter and energy is this thing you call Maya? I'll just make an observation and move on. It's not as strange as we may think. What is matter after all? Again, that silly joke. I mean, it's irresistible, but you know the philosophy joke? What is matter and what is mind? What is matter? Never mind. <laughs> what is mind? No matter. <laughs> Yeah, stupid joke. <laughs> but the philosopher um, Galen Strawson, who is here in uh, UT, Texas, actually, he wrote a, se uh, a serious paper, actually, an article for New York Times saying the hard problem of matter, sort of playing off on the hard problem of consciousness, is there is really no hard problem of consciousness. We think there is a hard problem of consciousness. How can physical matter produce something like consciousness and first-person experiences? It cannot, and therefore, hard problem of consciousness. Because in our mind, what is working is, somehow we have to reduce consciousness back to matter. We cannot do it, therefore, hard problem of consciousness. He says, why? Why not take it the other way around? Consciousness is immediately evident to us. I am consciousness. Matter appears to me in consciousness. So the question to ask is, what is matter? And that is the question physics has been asking. And he writes in that article, the more we investigate, the more we find solid matter disappearing into strangeness. In fact, there's even a particle called a strange quark. So into strangeness before us, just disappearing into paradoxes before us. The more the fundamental sciences probe, the more you end up with paradoxes. Incons inconsistencies. If you had asked scientists in 19th century, what would you expect for science in the 20th century? Person, you would have surely said, we will complete science. We'll get an absolute truth. And it will be consistent. 
and this I'm borrowing from Rebecca Goldstein on her, in her book on Godel. She says, the three greatest discoveries of science in the 20th century are the most strangest discoveries. Theory of relativity, not absolute truth, relativity. Uh, theory of incompleteness, Godel's theory of incompleteness. Uh, incompleteness, relativity, and Heisenberg's uncertainty. Relativity, incompleteness, uncertainty, these are the words for Maya. One more joke I must share with you. This is from Slavoj Zizek. Those of you don't know, know about him, you know that he's, I wouldn't say the wisest living philosopher here uh, in the world, I mean, in the uh, modern philosopher, but certainly the craziest. And those of you who don't know about him, don't try to find out. It, <laughs> he has a tendency of driving people insane. And if I say he's the craziest philosopher and he sees this, he will not mind. He'll take it as a compliment. So I met him uh, a couple of times, once at the New York Public Library, had a very interesting conversation with him. Anyway, the joke is something I heard in one of his talks. He says about the current state of physics, why is this a problem? Why are we at this strange juncture? He says, the joke is that God has underestimated our intelligence. <laughs> what is the joke about? He says that uh, uh, it's to do with video games. So uh, distinct, different in generations. My generation, we played video games and every generation after us, there are people belonging to earlier generations here who might not know what I'm talking about. In video games, when you go into the game, there might be certain places where you cannot enter because they have not been programmed. They're not part of the game. So they might be a house, and you are walking along in a virtual simulation. You try to enter the house, the door will not open. You cannot enter. There might be a forest. You try to go in there, you can't enter the forest. Just as a picture. Because the programmer has not programmed anything beyond that, it's not part of the game. You're not supposed to go there. Like that, imagine God programming this universe. And he goes, Atoms, they will discover. Rutherford and all, they will come. Atoms, electrons, and they will discover. So I'll program electron, proton, neutron. A little further level, some sub-nuclear particles I'll proton. And then he thought, Iske aage to nahi log. They will, they will not, never <laughs> penetrate further than this. So God, you can imagine, he stops. Enough, I'll call it a day. <laughs> this much is enough for the universe. But unfortunately, or fortunately, we have penetrated beyond that. And we are in the realm of super strings and whatnot, and a very strange uh, universe, entire zoo of uh, sub-nuclear particles has opened up. And beyond that, I was reading Michio Kaku's latest book, The God Equation, very masterfully written, the, late, the state of affairs in string theory. But exactly this, that the strangeness, maya vilasa, inconsistency, paradox, incompleteness, and Maya in Vedanta has no existence apart from Brahman, because Brahman is existence. So he says Maya Vilasa, Brahman or consciousness, it should be reduced to Chid Vilasa. I'm talking about Shankaracharya. He said all of this in one phrase. Chid Vilasa, Maya Vilasa is Chid Vilasa. It's the play of consciousness. This is the great philosophy of Kashmiri Shaivism, Pratyavigya. It is the play of Shiva, Chid Vilasa. This entire universe is the play of consciousness. Advaita Vedanta asks a difficult question there. Can consciousness actually play? Because play means change and activity. Some desire for enjoyment. Consciousness in itself has no desire, has no activity. Can it actually play? It can appear. That's what consciousness does. Knows. It can know something, appear something, uh, reveal something, illumine something. So instead of saying chid vilasa, reduce it further, that Shankaracharya says, to chid vivarta, an appearance in consciousness. I'll stop with this train of thought right here. I'll take it up a little later. I've given you, if you've counted, I've given you five steps. Jagat, panchabhuta vilasa, uh, maya vilasa, chid vilasa, chid vivarta. What is the universe? It is an appearance in consciousness. Whose appearance? Consciousness's appearance. In consciousness itself, the universe appears. Two more steps, which are really spectacular. I will come to it a little later. Next, Ashtavakra says, 
even more startling than vibhuhu next word he says atma sakshi vibhu purnaha purnam it is complete it is full it is whole it is infinite what does this mean this is the deepest secret of advaita vedanta a disciple of swami vivekananda an american lady she wrote to him saying that you have taught here a poem mary hail that you have taught that all is god and vivekananda wrote back in a poem i have never taught such a strange doctrine that all is god but you said all is god this <laughs> no what i meant was that god only is all is not there is only one reality call it god brahman atman chit and what you consider to be the all the all is not this is the great secret of purnam you see advaita vedanta is a, is the most living direct philosophy if it is understood if it's misunderstood it seems to be abstract so when the moment i talk about drashta and drishya it's understandable it's logical but it becomes very subtle and it seems to be sort of slippery and out of our grasp when we talk about existence pure existence pure consciousness existing things i can understand table chair person existing but what is pure existence it seems like an abstraction pure consciousness thoughts feelings emotions ideas i can understand but what is this pure consciousness it seems to be abstracted out of our grasp but advaita vedanta is exactly the opposite it should be understood as something that is living and always directly evident to us not an abstraction further uh, problem is caused by dialectics very you know logical argumentation which can make, make your head spin the entire several hundred year dialectics between advaita vedanta and vishishta advaita and dvaita vedanta very subtle a huge books have been written advaita siddhi kandana khanda khadya chit sukhi enough to make your head spin and make you feel it's not for us it's something very abstract only for pandit enjoyment of pandits but it's a living reality ashtavakra says purna it fills everything in the universe you go to a, a jewelry shop you have a variety of things um, you know bracelets tiaras um, rings necklaces gold but the gold is unique there the gold is purnaha because everything there is gold all the all the ornaments are gold look at the ocean thousands of waves and surf and bubbles but water is purnaha purnaha means every bit of it is nothing but water every bit of it here is nothing but that chit here is a very crucial point a delightful insight one sadhu in uttarakhand put it very beautifully whatever we have done till now the advaitin tells you drashta and drishya we have identified sakshi the witness consciousness not body not mind chidananda roopa shivoham i was pulling a fast one on you it's not right that is not advaita so here is the crucial question the sadhu put it beautifully I'll tell you in hindi what he said and then i'll translate back he said drashta drishya se to alag hai theek hai drishya kya drashta se alag hai you the consciousness you are separate from every object that you experience correct there's no doubt about it but the objects that you experience everything in this universe that you experience are they separate from you consciousness is separate from its objects drashta is separate from drishya the witness is separate from everything that it illumines but that which is illumined that which is the object that which is the scene and the drishya are they separate from the witness consciousness you see what kind of question is this so weird if uh, this object is separate from this object clearly this object is also separate from this object how can the two not be separate but no that's not always the case the waves are separate from the water in what sense the water can remain without being a wave it can remain as calm water it can remain as water vapor it can be a water in a glass like that it's not a wave 
but the wave cannot remain without water you the dreamer you are separate from every person that you saw in the dream and every object and every place that you saw in the dream you are separate you are never there you never met those persons you are sleeping but those objects and persons those dream entities they cannot exist for a fraction of a second without you the dreamer they are not separate from you in the movie all the characters a tragedy a comedy whatever is playing on the movie screen the screen is separate from them the screen is not a tragedy is not a comedy but the, all the tragedies and horror movies and science fiction movies and uh, comedies none of them are separate from the screen they cannot exist for a second without the screen this purna whatever you experience in the universe is nothing other than you the one consciousness appearing as an other there is no one separate from you not one thing separate from you this is a very deep they call it a rahasya gura a very deep secret about what is hinduism swami vivekananda put it in simple words he said we hindus worship a transcendent immanent god a transcendent god pure consciousness which is beyond time space and matter transcendent unchanging but immanent in and through all of this matter space time energy has no existence apart from that consciousness it is an appearance to consciousness it is an appearance in consciousness and nothing but consciousness the seven stages which i mentioned i will complete it now you remember the first five stages take the world as it is jagat and reduce it to matter pancha bhuta vilasa reduce it further to the paradox of maya maya vilasa and maya has no existence apart from consciousness itself chit vilasa and then chit it must be an appearance in consciousness chit vivatta but whatever appears in consciousness every bit of is pervaded by consciousness whatever appears in the movie screen every bit of it if you go and touch the hero in the movie if you go and touch the villain in the movie what are you touching the screen every bit of the movie is pervaded by the screen similarly every bit of the appearance is pervaded by consciousness chin maya chit vivarta is further reduced to chin maya pervaded by consciousness sixth step one final stunning step he says chin matra consciousness alone how how can a thing pervade a thing pervade something else in two ways if you light incense here it will pervade this space this space exists light incense incense will pervade this space this space exists in darkness switch on the chandelier light will pervade this space does consciousness pervade its appearance in that way there is an appearance and then it is pervaded by consciousness no there is no appearance apart from consciousness it is consciousness alone there is no such thing as an appearance there is no such thing as a false world when you say jagat mithya there is a separate false world no it is consciousness alone chin matram consciousness alone look at the seven stages in which a solid world seemingly out there is reduced to you the pure consciousness jagat world pancha bhuta vilasa the play of five elements maya vilasa the play of maya chit vilasa the play of consciousness chit vivarta the appearance of consciousness chin maya pervasion by consciousness chin matra pure consciousness tatvamasi you are that this is called purnam everything you meet is god your own reality everybody you meet is god your own reality yesterday i was seeing in front of the lord jagannath chanting beautifully the gita govinda jay devas hymns dashavatar stotra hindu see god in the fish avatar in the tortoise avatar in the boar in the in the lion the nrsingha in uh, um, uh, so uh, one after another how can a fish be god how can a tortoise be god how can the sacred cow be god how can a human being be god remember drashta drishya se alag hai lekin drishya drashta se alag nahi hai no so is is this 
cow god is this man god is this fish god no nedam yadidam upasate upanishad says no it is not god in itself but it is none other than god if you say the the, the lethal mistake which is made is if you say that the cow and the fish and the man and the stone in this world the good and the bad and the ugly they are not god there's something other than god if you say then your god becomes no god at all because there exists entities apart from god when your god is a limited god a limited god is no god at all to be truly infinite there must not be anything outside that divinity and the extreme of this doctrine is advaita vedanta the divinity alone and that appears as everything else all of this is packed into purnaha this purnaha this infinite unlimited divinity this its philosophical consequence one little implication is advaita non dualism what does advaita mean no second reality there is no second reality apart from this pure consciousness pure being this no second reality is the philosophy of advaita it all comes from purnaha how can this not be free muktaha this reality pure consciousness which is the witness consciousness it is one in all beings it appears as this universe it is nothing but the entire universe is nothing but this purnaha this is free mukta akriya beyond action if it is beyond action then the results of karma the law of karma cannot bind it it must be free always be free not suddenly becoming free was always free its freedom is recognized by error brahmat samsara vani eva by error it seemed to be i am father mother brother husband wife i am sick i am ill i am poor i am i am inferior or i am superior i am great you don't you know who i am uh, all of this brahmat by an error stuck to one little corner of the appearance forgetting my true infinite glory and i interact with the world and i suffer from lifetime to lifetime brahmat samsara vani but when you move from brahma ignorance error to knowledge from ignorance to knowledge from correct the error and mukta free swami vivekananda said good good bad bad and none escape the law law of karma good karma result will be good good in the sense sukha happiness pleasant life bad karma if you are deliberately naughty then the result will be unpleasant bad bad none escape the law the law of karma cannot be escaped that's why when persons first arise to some kind of religious awareness there often comes a sense of guilt and sin because we have we have a long we are what do you call them history sheeters or we have a, we have many many sins to our account lifetimes even the greatest of villains of today are no, are no match for each one of us so we we have all of this and we become aware of it it's not a bad thing it can be crushing but it's not a bad thing it leads to a, a deep a seriousness in spiritual life and a kind of reliance on the divinity but good good bad bad none escape the law but what is advaita vedanta saying swami vivekananda says there but far whoever wears the form wears the chain too if you accept this form i am just this body and mind then you are tied to the chain of karma which produced this body and my which uh, which affects this which produced this body and affects this mind trace uh, which is the links of which go back to time immemorial we are bound by the chain whoever wears a form must wear the chain too and then he says but what is advaita saying far beyond name and form is atman ever free no thou art that say om no thou art that sanyasi bold say om tat sat om so the saying om tat sat om in another language uh, ashtavakra is saying atma sakshi vibhu purna ekah mukta chid akriya what is the result of this asanga nispriha shanta nothing whatsoever sticks to you does an ornament stick to gold it's what a strange question 
We never thought of it that way. No, the gold can be made into a necklace and melted and made into a bracelet, melted and made into a ring, uh, into a tiara. The forms do not stick to the material gold. Do the waves stick to water? No. Do the clouds stick to the sky? No. Do all the dream persons and objects and the activities in the dream stick to you, the dreamer? No. No, none of it. Neither the good nor the bad. You are entirely free. Asanga, Nispriya. Think about it for a moment. If I am not, if the world is not a separate reality, there is no world out there. There is no body there. There is really no mind, no thoughts, no feelings, no emotions. The blankness which you get, drop that also. In that unspeakable awareness which alone re remains, what desire does it have? Is it incomplete? What does it need? Nothing. What can make it unhappy? Nothing. Nispriya without any desire, without any incompleteness. And therefore, shanta, peace itself, beyond the possibility of disturbance. There's a peace which can be disturbed. There's a silence which can be overcome by, no by noise. But there's a silence, a peace, which noise can come and go, it doesn't disturb that. That deep silence, it's a spiritual silence. The Atman itself is silence. The Atman itself is Shanta. This word Shanta, in the Mandukya Upanishad, seventh mantra, the Atman is described as Shanta. Shantam, Shivam, Advaitam, Chaturtam, Manyanti. So Shantam, Atma is Shanta. Gaurapada Acharya, Shankaracharya's master's master, writes a whole chapter, Vaitatya Prakarana, the chapter on the falsity of the universe, on this word Shanta. This is our real nature. Asanga, Nispriya, Shanta. Right now, doesn't feel like that? Brahmat samsara vaniva. Only by error, only by not seeing, only by not inquiry. We are in this state. It's a matter of taking one step. Make it very easy. It is constantly available to us. It's right before our eyes, right? Not even before our nose, behind our nose. Behind our nose, in front of our nose, everywhere, all the time, it is effortlessly present for us. And just this inquiry breaks the veil, pierces through the thinnest of veils, and shows us the glory which is our, very, our real nature. I pray to Sri Ramakrishna, to the Holy Mother Sharada Devi, to Swami Vivekananda, to bless us all so that we may have this inquiry in our lives and the magnificent result of that inquiry. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Arpanamastu Okay, I think it just overshot time by a few minutes. The so Swamiji has given such a wonderful talk. Uh, we normally have a question and answers uh, afterwards, but today I'm going to ask that we skip the question and answer session uh, because we're going to have Arati, and then the Swami has to leave this afternoon. Uh, but it's also, uh, in my estimation, appropriate that we not have questions because the ideas that he gave were so deep that now if people start asking different questions, it uh, distracts the mind from that which we have heard. So uh, I don't feel bad about uh, uh, saying that we won't have question and answer now. We'll have the uh, arati. Uh, but let me just express our deep uh, uh, thanks to the Swami for a wonderful talk, uh, wonderfully illuminating, as I, and as I said in the beginning, and as all of you who have listened to him know, he's extraordinary in his ability to make 
very uh, subtle points understandable. So we thank him for coming. This is not his first time here, and we want to make sure that it's not his last time here also, insofar as we have the ability to make sure of such things, <laughs> which actually is very little, but we hope that through the grace of uh, the divine that he will be back uh, from time to time. And whenever he can come, we'll be delighted to, to have him. And let me also say, I meant to say in the beginning, I didn't, but we're very honored to have uh, Brahmacharini Shweta Chaitanya here. She's uh, in Brahmacharini with the Chinmay Mission, uh, who uh, was with Swami Sarva Priyanandaji at, at the program in, uh, at Harvard. She was one of the students uh, when Swami Sarva Priyanandaji was also studying there. So we're very happy to have her here and happy that all of you could come. So I'll give a closing chant and then we'll have Arati for those who can stay for Arati. Om Madhu Vatarita Yate Madhu Sharanti Sindhavaha Madhvir Nasantvo Shadhi Madhu Nakta Muto Shasi Madhu Mat Parthi Vagum Rajaha Madhu Dyaurastu Nafita Madhu Mando Vanaspatir Madhu Magumastu Suryaha Madhvir Kavo Bhavantunaha Om Madhu Om Madhu Om Madhu For us who seek the truth and for all living beings, may the winds blow sweetly, may the rivers flow sweetly, may the herbs yield us sweetness. Sweet be the night and the break of day, sweet be the very dust of the earth. May the heavens pour down sweetness upon us, may the trees, lords of the forest, bear us sweetness. May the sun shed its sweetness upon us, may all the directions pour forth sweetness. Om sweetness, sweetness, sweetness. Thank you.